So my talk's a little bit different than some of the other ones today. It was stepping through all these wonderful results and showing these really big studies. But today I'm showing more of a proof of concept, kind of will molecular methods actually work to analyze and identify diet content in flathead catfish. And unfortunately, I've heard some really great talks today where you're able to actually readily identify uh, parts of the diet. With these guys, we're getting a lot of unidentifiable chunks and goo. So it's quite problematic, but we're working through some methods to help us out and to get some reliable um, identification back. So I know some of you may have been in here for Jeff's talk right before the break, so this pairs really nicely. But just to give a little more background, flathead catfish are a relatively recent and in introduced species in the Susquehanna River in Pennsylvania. So quite far from here, but uh, they were first introduced in the lower reaches and since have expanded well throughout um, parts of this as well as some of the tributaries like the Juniata River. They also have this really wide recreational appeal and actually in 2019 the state record was caught from the Susquehanna River weighing over 50 pounds. So anglers are really enjoying catching this introduced fish. Uh, Fish and Boat Commission has been doing a lot of really great studies in our system. So they're looking at growth rates. Jeff talked about some of the work earlier. Uh, age structure analysis of bondage, trying to get a better hand on some of the basic characteristics of this fish species and of the populations in the Susquehanna River. Which is all really great, but we still have a lot that we need to learn. And one of the emerging concerns or questions is we know flathead catfish are a predator, an opportunistic predator at that but we don't really know what they're feeding on in the Susquehanna River. And I had to get a little smallmouth bass plug in because I spent seven years before this working with smallmouth bass. Um, and so we're concerned about a lot of potential prey communities um, throughout the Susquehanna River, whether it be native fish or established fish communities, recreational sport fish like the smallmouth bass, which have a pretty um, periled recent history of population declines and disease as well as various species of greatest conservation needs. So ones that are being restored, threatened and endangered species. We really don't have a good handle on what these guys are potentially eating, which is a large concern for our management as well as many other agencies in the state. One thing we do know is where they've been introduced elsewhere, they eat a lot of different things. They eat a lot of different prey species. So um, some studies that came out from the from introduced range in, the, in Virginia, including the James, Rappahannock, and York river systems. Flathead catfish were found to prey on a lot of different items, um, some of them including striped bass, white perch, gizzard shad, various alice, migratory allocenes. Um, and a lot of those species we actually do not have in the Susquehanna River. So we don't have a good idea in terms of comparing some of the other studies. But in this system, in the Virginia studies, they used a combinational approach using morphometric characteristics and molecular techniques to identify the prey fish that were in their diets. And so this approach used universal fish barcoding markers as part of the cytochrome C oxidase subunit, which is a generally widely used area for um, barcoding a bunch of different species. And it's performed using multiple primers and a cocktail to try to get really good representation of different fish that would be potentially found in those communities. So it's really great that this has been done elsewhere. But we have a few questions. We don't know for sure if this is going to work in the Susquehanna. Our prey communities are very different. Um, so they differ widely from these studies in the previous systems. And we also think that they likely vary across the basin. So in the lower reaches, they'd be quite different than some of the tributaries. Anecdotal reports from Fish and Boat Commission has found a variety of prey items in the diets of flathead catfish, ranging from crayfish, various fish species. They like to eat rocks too. We find quite a few rocks in their stomachs as an incidental um, digestion part, I guess. Um, and the diet contents are highly variable and widely degraded in most cases. If you look really closely here, this is actually a caudal fin sticking out of the mouth of that flathead. Uh, so they eat pretty large items as well. So our emerging question, which I'm going to talk about today, is whether or not we can use similar methods 
that have been done in some of the other studies and then expand upon them in looking at the use of molecular techniques for identifying prey items in their diet. So our three main objectives that I'm going to talk about today, again, I mentioned this is more proof of concept. We first want to see if we could identify known prey items or potential prey items um, using molecular methods. So this is what I'll call our quality control analysis. So for this, my collaborators went out and got me a bunch of fin clips, and we tested whether or not we could use molecular methods to identify those known fish species. We then wanted to consider how we might handle different methods um, that we would use for different levels of degradation. So some of the fish might be identifiable, others might be partially digested, and then we very scientifically categorize what's left as goo, which is just a mush of leftover stuff. Um, so we want to be able to consider all of these different aspects. And so to evaluate some of this, we actually have some test samples that we use to see whether or not these methods would work. And for these test samples, I'm primarily focusing on more traditional sequencing methods that would just take um, a chunk of tissue from an individual and isolate its DNA and then sequence that. So the first thing I want to talk about is this quality control analysis. So for that, we started with 28 different fish species, and we're continuing to expand this as well, from seven different families that we see in the Susquehanna River, as well as crayfish, because we anecdotally have found crayfish in their diets as well. Families range from um, having American eel and anguillidae to various minnows and cyprinids, uh, white sucker, other catastomids. We have both a sample from flathead as well as channel catfish. Um, northern pike, smallmouth bass, other centrarchids as well, and various um, members of the person family, so darters, yellow perch, and walleye. And then two of our most common crayfish species, the introduced rusty crayfish and um, another crayfish, the Allegheny crayfish that we see. And so our basic steps were to take these tissue samples, extract them, use our PCR primers that have traditionally been uh, used in other studies, and then sequence the samples in both forward and reverse direction to then have a consensus sequence and compare that against online databases. So the tissue samples included both fin clips and or chunks of muscle. Again, this is very traditional Sanger sequencing methods using that previously established primer cocktail. So it's actually four primers that are put into a mix and then the results that we got back from our genomic core facility. So I actually send the sequences out. I do most of this in-house and then send the sequences out. Um, those are compared against the MCBI database using the BLAST search tool. So to jump into some of the results, we typically use a greater than 99% match with a high query cover, close to 100% for a species ID. 26 of our 28 species had no problem. Most of them were actually 100% match. Um, so we had pretty high confidence in that. There were two samples that were somewhat problematic. So shorthead red horse fell just below that 99%. And this has to do with likely um, not having enough uh, comparison samples in the database. So we now have our own sample to compare against. And the mimic shiner, which is an, actually another introduced shiner in our system, there were another closely um, matching species of shiner that we don't see. Uh, but again, it may limit us to some taxonomic resolution in some of these minnow species, which is an important consideration. The fish primers didn't amplify crayfish DNA, which we didn't really expect them to, but we thought we might as well try it. And so we had to then figure out what type of primers we could use for them. So I investigated the use of two different um, Primers that could work on invertebrates. I happened to have these for some worm stuff I did in the past, and I tested them. So again, using part of the cytochrome oxidase, as well as a 16S ribosomal RNA um, gene. And I found that the LCO, HCO cytochrome oxidase markers worked really well, and we're also able to identify our two crayfish species with that. So now we have markers that work for both fish and crayfish. We're getting our bases covered, which is really great. So now we know that this works, but we now have to deal with this different level of prey digestion. So this is an example of the gut contents from one of my um, 
fish samples. We like to say it looks like sushi, but um, it's actually pretty nasty. This was what would be left of a fish, so it's mostly a few bones and some muscle. Crayfish are pretty much intact, but then there's a lot of just random chunks. And then this is what's left over that we call the goo. So a whole bunch of random pieces. And so we're looking at employing multiple techniques. The first being anything that we can separate, taking individual pieces and using traditional sign or sequencing to identify. So example, taking chunks from this fish or chunks from that crayfish. What's left, we're working on developing um, next generation sequencing tools for, so we can get maybe some more stuff from that goo. So I'm gonna go through the use of number one first on some test samples, and then talk about some of the progress with the goo, because that is a more in-depth and then complicated procedure. So to test out whether or not we, it works to take individual chunks of tissue from these diets, we started with four samples. Um, First thing I noticed is that the samples were extremely diverse. So some were this mixed crayfish, fish, goo. Others were, this is a one large chunk of fish. It was about 10 or 11 inches big. Um, others were completely mangled muscle and bones. And so there was a really wide variability of state of the sample and what was in the sample. And also a wide range of content volume. So some I could fit in a wave boat, others not happening, just a huge mess. And as you guys know, we work with catfish. This does not smell very good. So I stunk up the whole third floor of my labs whenever we were thawing these samples out. My research text didn't always appreciate that, but it's science and you get used to it. So they're quite stinky, but that's all part of it. So with these samples, um, anything that I could remove that were pieces of tissues, we removed and cut small, about 10 millimeter by 10 millimeter piece of tissue, and then just did traditional DNA extraction from these. So in the field, these samples were just removed from the stomach, placed in a Ziploc bag, and frozen. I thawed them and then individually sorted them in the lab. Each chunk of tissue I got, I actually did multiple pieces of extraction because I wanted to have a pretty high confidence in the data I was getting back. So I actually sent in multiple samples from each chunk. The remaining goo was placed in a 50 ml conical vial uh, with 95% ethanol added for future analysis. And I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, as I move through. So just to show some results, um, the first diet sample I had had uh, quite a variety. So this was actually that picture I showed. We had a cut lips minnow, um, rusty crayfish pieces and a whole rusty crayfish and then one chunk was actually flathead catfish. So this was actually a piece of tissue that came back as flathead catfish, so eating the same species. The second diet was primarily a degraded fish that was, came back as a smallmouth bass. The third sample, this sample was a mess. It was um, all muscle and bones, and every piece I took off came back as a white sucker. So it was a mangled white sucker. And then the last one was a huge large fish, and this one was also a smallmouth bass. Um, so in just the four samples that we've looked at, we already have five different fish species and a crayfish uh, documented as well. So again, these chunks of tissue were taken, and then we actually sequenced them forward in reverse direction. And we had multiple samples for each one of these as well, so we could have consistent data to compare against. Well, there's still another part of the story, and that's what are we going to do with the goo? Okay, again, remember goo is very scientific here, but it's basically what's left. And so this is what it might look like. A slurry in this conical vial with some ethanol on top. And so there could be a lot that we're missing from that goo still. So what we're working on doing is developing a next generation sequencing assay. It's actually using a pack by a long read sequencing approach, which really just means that we can use the same primers that we're using for our standard sequencing analysis. But there's a few caveats to this. So one, we have to worry about prey of prey. So we have to look at what we're seeing most prevalent in the sample. So in terms of the sample reads we get back. The other thing is that these samples came from the stomach of a flathead catfish. So they likely have a lot of flathead catfish DNA. So right now, I've just developed a blocking primer to block 
flathead catfish DNA to try to reduce amplification of that. So it's actually called a, um, it's a PNA probe, it's a synthetic uh, peptide nucleic acid probe that binds to flathead catfish DNA. So I've uniquely created that out of an alignment of all the genomic data I could find for fish, um, and it should block to that and prevent amplification, theoretically. So there's just actually, I just received the sample this week, um, and so I'll be testing that out very soon. And so the way we extract from this is essentially we vortex it um, quite rapidly, shake it up as much as we can, and then extract aliquots from it. So just remove like a one mil sample, spin it down, and extract from that pellet. Uh, so that's what I've started doing now. And then the next step is to kind of work on the bench work for this and get that assay going. So just to kind of start to summarize this a little bit, the universal CO1 markers do seem to be working quite well for fish identification. There may be some considerations with taxonomic resolution, specifically for the species level identification of like some shiners, minnows, things like that. We may not be able to get down to species level. We also have been able to identify a primer set for crayfish, so that helps add more tools to our toolbox, so we can identify not just fish, but also crayfish DNA. The methods appear to be working well for pieces of tissue from our <laughs> diet samples. So again, talking about the proof of concept, um, it seems like this is a feasible study to really move forward with. We've identified again five species and one crayfish from four samples. And some take-homes that we've learned is that multiple pieces need to be removed because they are so degraded. And we've had to do some additional sample cleanup to help remove some of the inhibitors. So just the next steps is what I'm going to end on. Again, working on this next generation sequencing with the goo. We are also starting a large-scale study in 2020. We've just recruited a master's student. So we're looking at doing more of a basin-wide collection of diets and also looking at two different seasonal time frames. And we're hoping to also incorporate this in relationship to prey communities at these different sites. So we have uh, state collaborators that do a lot of IBI surveys. So we're going to try to tie the prey consumed by the fish into the fish that are actually found at the sites. Uh, and that's pretty much all I have. There's a lot of collaborators. I received funding. Um, from Penn State to get some of this work started, and we just received a grant from Pennsylvania Sea Grant to fund our grad student. And that's all I have. If I may have any questions.